In the autumn of 1944, America's newest air weapon, the powerful Super Fortress, was used with great effect in raids over Japan. On these missions, the B-29s were exposed to attack by Japanese fighters. Without fighter cover, the huge bombers were vulnerable to these persistent attacks by the Japanese fighters. Just halfway between the B-29 bases in the Marianas and the target, Japan, the island called Iwo Jima was in an ideal position for use by the U.S. as a base from which to launch fighters to accompany the B-29s on their missions. In late 1944, the U.S. High Command decided that Iwo Jima must be seized, and preparations were made for the assault against that island fortress. Beginning in October, American B-24s made regular pre-invasion bomb runs to Iwo. The 7th Air Force bombed Iwo Jima almost daily for 72 days in late 1944 and early 45. At U.S. bases in the Pacific, Marines of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Divisions prepared for the assault. The invasion troops were accompanied on the trip to the objective by great quantities of materiel, the machines of 20th century war. With the assault forces aboard ship, the task force moved northward toward the island target in mid-February. In waters so close to the enemy's homeland, it was no longer possible to capitalize on the element of surprise. The Marines who were to make the assault were briefed on the enemy and his defenses. No punches were pulled. The men were told that Iwo was the closest thing to a fortress in the Pacific Ocean. At least they knew what to expect. There was nothing further the commanders could do to change the complexion of the head-on assault. Before the men stormed ashore to seize the island fortress, a last blessing was given by the troop chaplain. The final divine services on shipboard were attended by many of the assault marines, who welcomed the opportunity to rededicate their efforts to God. The warships opened up on the island at 6.40 on D-Day morning. An interested observer aboard the flagship was Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal, who said at that time, this target, like Tarawa, leaves very little except to take it by force of arms, character, and courage. Mount Suribachi, which dominated the island, was a prime target for Navy gunners. The preliminaries to the actual landing went off smoothly. H hour had been set at 9 a.m. and everyone was intent on making it on schedule. Trained to razor sharpness, the Marines took to the boats early on D-Day morning. Some 10,000 men of the 4th and 5th Marine Divisions left the transports to make the initial assault. On that faintly chilly February morning, the sea was calm. Many of the Marines were veterans of other campaigns. Some had never been in combat before. Men like Private First Class Harold Wergers. I tried to figure out what time it was in St. Louis, my hometown. This operation had all the earmarks of being a real fight. At a time like this, you felt all keyed up inside, the blood coursing through your veins so fast your fingertips tingled. quick and start getting some of those guys who are firing at our ships and scoring a hit every now and then. It seemed like hours getting to the beach. It began to get rougher, but my outfit, the 1st Battalion, 28th Marine Regiment, made it okay. 
find it on schedule. It seemed weird, knowing how many Japs there were, getting set to let you have it, but not being able to see a one of them. Pretty soon, you knew for sure they were there. On the beach, it got really rugged. I never expected it to be this rough. Some companies were cut down to half strength that first morning. Half their men knocked out. More men were landed, including the rest of my regiment, the 28th Marines. We had to hang on to that beachhead, whatever happened. even tougher was the slow going in that volcanic sand. It slowed us down and it slowed the equipment down. The fight for the beachhead at Iwo was a real nightmare. I don't think any of us will ever forget it. That first morning about a third of the men in our company got hit. But we kept on fighting for that toehold. Iwo didn't get any more comfortable at any time during those first few days. The corpsmen had their hands full. They were busier than any of us. A lot of our equipment got bogged down in the loose sand and was knocked out by the enemy. And an awful lot of Marines got it on the beach at Iwo. On the evening of D plus two, the U.S. ships offshore were attacked in a heavy air raid. The gunners scored hits on some of the Japanese suicide planes. In the furious three-hour-long battle, the U.S. lost one carrier and had another damaged. Fifteen of the kamikazes were knocked down. From Mount Suribachi, the Japanese poured their fire on the landing beaches below. No spot on the U.S. beachhead was protected from enemy fire, as long as the Japanese held Suribachi. The job of bringing additional troops ashore under that heavy pounding was a delicate operation. And just as important as the added manpower was the materiel, which was so necessary in the drive to reduce the enemy's fortress. It became obvious on the first day that Suribachi would have to be taken as quickly as possible. Elements of the 28th Marine Regiment were assigned the job of seizing Suribachi, including Private First Class Werger's unit. We gave the hot rock everything we had. that opening, you'd have thought we could have walked right up the side of the mountain. We gained a little ground, but the enemy kept letting us have it. We picked up a few yards here and there, but we had a long way to go. So many men got hit, there weren't enough Navy corpsmen to go around, and they took heavy casualties too. We kept pushing ahead, making every cliff count. But it was tough going. They kept pouring it down on top of us. 
It seemed like weeks, just fighting for the land around the base of the rock. Finally, on what they tell me was the fourth day on Iwo, we began to pick our way up the slope. On the way up, we ran into some Japs, but they didn't give us too much trouble. This was no place for anybody with a weak stomach. The Marines of the 28th Regiment spent four days in getting to the crest of the 556-foot-high mountain. Once again, the Marine spirit had been a prime factor in the capture of this difficult objective against great odds. On February 23, 1945, the Marines raised the U.S. flag atop Mount Suribachi as a signal to the troops below that the mountain was won. That flag was seen around the world. During those first five days on Iwo, the Marine Corps suffered 6,845 casualties. Of that number, 5,284 were wounded, and a great many of those men were saved. Most of the wounded were surgical cases. Some of the casualties were suffering badly from shock. The men who took Suribachi were able to appreciate why it had been so tough the enemy had been solidly entrenched. The Japanese on Iwo's mountain had fought one of the most determined defenses of the war. But it had proved fruitless. Hundreds of dead Japanese soldiers were strewn about the slopes of Mount Suribachi after the battle. The situation was reversed. The U.S. forces now dominated the southern end of the island. The original U.S. beachhead was littered with wrecked equipment. But though a considerable amount of material had been rendered useless to the U.S. fighting men on Iwo, other machines and weapons in impressive quantities had been successfully brought ashore and put to use against the enemy. Ground Forces Commander Marine General Holland Smith was anxious to have the area cleared of enemy mines and rendered safe for the landing of additional reinforcements and supplies for use in the drive north on the island. 3rd Marine Division combat troops, which had been held in reserve, landed on Iwo with 3rd Marine Division headquarters and attached units. The two regimental combat teams of the 3rd Marine Division now on the island were to be used in the center of the drive north. The reinforcements, too, were surprised by the difficult footing. In the loose volcanic sand, vehicles designed for use on any terrain bogged down hopelessly. On Iwo, metal mats were essential for the movement of many vehicles inland from the beaches. The invading Marines had not expected to have so much trouble with Iwo's soil, but they overcame the problem in short order nevertheless. Before the concerted attack against the enemy for the northern section of the island, some Marines attended religious services only a short distance from enemy positions to the north. One of the Marines' most pressing supply problems was the lack of water on the island. After the southern end of the island had been secured, the Marines installed distillation units, which converted the seawater and signaled the end of limited water rationing, which had prevailed since the morning of D-Day. With Suribachi and the southern end of Iwo one, the U.S. forces girded themselves for the conquest of the northern section of the island. The three marine divisions which would fight that campaign were well prepared. Some of the men who had battled the enemy on Mount Suribachi took a few moments off to clean up before going back into action. U.S. forces controlled the southern end of the island, but still had to seize the broader northern section. General Holland Smith and his staff were faced with the problem of taking that territory from a well-disciplined enemy force of considerable size. The Marines' campaign against the enemy on the northern part of the island, which had been begun on the second day, picked up momentum after Suribachi had been taken.
and all the marine units on the island could be concentrated on the final sweep to the north. That drive called for the perfect coordination of the troops of the three marine divisions, working smoothly together under difficult conditions. The success of the marine drive to the northern tip of Iwo depended in large measure on the performance in action of U.S. tanks. Some 150 Shermans were employed on Iwo to pace the advance of marine ground forces in the drive north. This phase of the battle for Iwo was much tougher than the fight for Suribachi. For a solid week, 4th Division Marines fought for a series of ridges surrounding Hill 382, less formally known as the Meat Grinder. And for a week, they were driven back. Then the drive northward on the right flank continued. Once its rockets were fired, the vulnerable rocket launchers quickly left the area. Casualties grew heavier as the Marines pushed the frantic enemy into a smaller and smaller corner of the island. In some areas, the territory had to be taken ridge by ridge. for the capture of the 3rd airfield on Iwo was executed by 3rd Division Marines, who led the advance up the island at the point of the wedge-shaped offensive. In crashing through the enemy's strong defensive line, the men of the 3rd Division took quite a beating. The men of the two regimental combat teams of the 3rd Marine Division broke the back of the enemy's main stand in the north of Iwo. on the island was rapidly being whittled down. But even though the main defense belt had been penetrated, the weary Marines still had some territory to seize from the stubbornly resisting enemy. The U.S. force had suffered the loss of much equipment and thousands of fighting men. But Iwo Jima, only 750 miles from Tokyo, was almost entirely in American possession. No longer would enemy planes take off from Iwo's strips on missions against U.S. forces in the heart of Japan's inner defense zone. The campaign on Iwo Jima had several noteworthy aspects from a medical standpoint. One was the employment of whole blood and plasma on a scale never before attempted with gratifying results. It had been estimated that casualties would total 31% of the entire force. Actually, casualties amounted to almost 33% of U.S. manpower participating in the operation on the island. The Navy operated an evacuation hospital, which began functioning on the island on the ninth day of the battle. All the necessary facilities were available to Navy doctors and corpsmen, working only a mile or two from the front. With the opening of several evacuation hospitals on Iwo, it was possible for all initial surgery to be performed on the island itself. The most difficult cases were operated on as quickly as possible, often less than an hour after the wound had been sustained, and the lives of thousands of fighting men were saved. Starting on the 13th day of the battle for Iwo, many of the casualties were evacuated by air. At certain times, this method provided the only means of evacuation from the island because of unfavorable sea conditions or lack of facilities afloat. During the last three weeks of the battle on Iwo, about 100 casualties a day were put aboard planes and flown off the island. <laughs> <laughs> 
by March 16th, the Marines had won all of Iwo, except for a small area near the northern tip of the island. Japanese who had been taken prisoner were used to appeal to their brothers in arms to surrender. But in most cases, the appeals were not as successful as other methods of persuasion. Some prisoners were taken on Iwo, but they represented only a handful of the 22,000 troops who had fought the carefully executed defense of the island. Only 217 prisoners were taken, 159 of them Japanese. As on other Pacific battlegrounds, the soldiers who surrendered spoke readily about the location of their positions. The Marines were eager to clean out the last enemy pocket. who were engaged in seizing the last enemy area had been fighting on Iwo for almost four weeks. It was slow, exacting work. Finally, by March 25th, the men completed the job. In the battle for the last pocket, some of the enemy soldiers had held out until the very end. In Iwo Jima, the enemy lost one of its most vital defensive bastions. After 36 days of the most bitter fighting American forces had ever known, the U.S. had all of Iwo. For that eight square mile heap of volcanic ash jutting out of the Pacific, the U.S. had paid an exorbitant price the lives of 5,563 Marines and 982 sailors. In addition to the dead, the casualty figure showed some 19,000 men wounded in the battle for Iwo Jima. Tons of shell cases gave evidence of the important role played by artillery in the five-week-long campaign. U.S. forces in the Pacific had decided that Iwo must be taken at any cost and they had thrown themselves into the struggle with all the power available. With the job successfully accomplished, the top priority assignment was the extension of one of the airfields so that it could accommodate America's newest heavy bombers. Marine engineering units and Navy construction battalions accomplished their job in miraculously short order. The field's great value to the U.S. lay in its use as an emergency base for crippled B-29s, unable to return all the way to their Marianas bases. More than 850 damaged B-29s landed safely at Iwo during the following three months. In addition, Iwo strips provided a perfect base for U.S. fighter planes, now capable of making it to Japan and return. With fighter cover, the raids on Japan were less hazardous. After the victory at Iwo, Okinawa was the next major enemy island on the U.S. schedule. An assault force of soldiers and Marines made the invasion on Easter Sunday, 1945. 